welcome to The Microscopists, a bite-sized bio podcast, hosted by Peter O'Toole, sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. Today on The Microscopists. How, how do you keep that drive uh, and to balance that pressure that you have? Well, first off, we don't write grants, so that's really nice. So you don't have the pressure of constantly getting a feedback or worried about writing a grant. Basically, we write papers or we write reviews. You, you do the science. Welcome to The Microscopists. Today, I talked with Jennifer lippicott Schwartz of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute at the Genelia Research Campus. Very few cell biologists have had so many major impacts on their field, and in the opinion, most of this work was the use of the microscope itself, with many discoveries going hand in hand with the development of microscopy. Beyond incredibly kayaking to work and a passion for plants, Jennifer explained how she became interested in biology from a time teaching in Africa and how she was fortunate enough in her early career to work alongside some of the true giants of cell biology. Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole, uh, and today in the Microscopist, I'm going to be talking to Jennifer Lippicott Schwartz from Genelia F uh, Research Campus uh, over in the US. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, um, Peter. Um, uh, pleasure. I, I, Genelia Farm must be an awesome place to work. So, uh, yeah, I've been there, I've visited it, uh, inspired by it. I, you know, I was, I was envious, but what's it actually like to really work there? It's pretty amazing. Um, Every day that I walk into the campus, I feel like I'm walking into another sort of futuristic world. Um, it's the first time that I ever thought about where you could really create a enclosed environment that you would feel perfectly happy living in forever, sort of. Um, I mean, there's just so many windows that you feel like you're in a spaceship, actually. and um, and that gives you a really cool feeling about your research that you're you're sort of you're in a special place and so you must be doing things that are comparable to that um so it, it makes it really impacts i think the way a lot of people feel about what work they're doing um being in that beautiful environment uh, how how tough and competitive is it in there? I mean, come on, these are the elite scientists. Certainly, from from when I look from the outside, it is full of elite scientists. Well, so that's what's so cool is that you do not feel in any way that there's that competitive aspect to the place, um, and that really surprised me because you know there's a lot of other places you go to, and you just walk in and you just like, oh my god, you know this is a scary kind of place, but. Um, at Genelia, you don't feel that way at all. People are, because it's small, they're, the labs are small, the PIs don't have big empires, and as a consequence of that, they are willing to just talk to anybody. So you can, you know, you bump into anybody at the coffee place, at the coffee shop, and you can talk to them. Um, so it's, it's, it's really nice from that, uh, from that perspective. Now, I should say that I'm not a postdoc at Genelia. <clears throat> And that's different. I mean, I have to talk from a perspective of somebody who has come there as a senior scientist. Yeah. Um, but uh, my sense is that the postdocs and the younger people also feel invigorated in the same way that, that I do. Well, what about the pressure, though? Because, again, to maintain that, that, that the momentum that you, you carry into there and to continue that momentum, how do you keep yeah. what, what motivates you? How do you keep that going? Um, you mean in my own lab or to, in, are, are you talking broadly about the Genelians themselves? No, how do they really, motivate themselves? From your own perspective, uh, yeah. how, how do you keep that drive uh, and to balance that pressure that you have? Well, first off, we don't write grants, so that's really nice. So you don't have the pressure of constantly getting a feedback or worried about writing a grant. Basically, we write papers or we write reviews. You, you do the science. And... Um, so it's all about the science and actually there's a lot of collaborative science going on at Genelia, which is really cool. And you bump into people and you start up all kinds of collaborations between, you know, between different labs. And that's, 
that itself is very motivating when you have um, a larger set of people that are sort of participating with each other to push things through. Um, for me, uh, yeah, I try not to let out uh, exterior things like a grant or whatever um, <clears throat> be a motivating worry or concern. Yeah. Um, there's enough things that you can get concerned about um, to sort of have that impact you. What I think is, um, what I try to have motivate me is the science, the excitement of the science. Um, like, I don't like doing things that are not significant. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I think it's really, there's, I always tell my students, I mean, they'll, they, they're happily moving, you know, with their experiments and, um, you know, they want to write a paper and if it's not significant, um, you know, my view is, look, it takes so much effort to get a paper out, to get a paper, to make it really, really good that you may as well have it on something that is really changing our perspective of things. So, um, in anything that we work on, we try to look at it from a perspective that gives a new, per, a new view, a new twist in some way. Um, so, so you're not, that's, that's what gets me excited. Yeah. So, so you're not having to write grants. Yeah. But does that mean you have more freedom of how you can move the direction you can move your research in? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I, th absolutely. Um, I mean, I think there is value in writing grants in that it forces you to conceptualize an issue um, in a very rigorous way, but it also narrows your thinking. Um, and, you know, there's particular um, ways that you write grants in order for them to be successful, which limits the creativity that you can put into that grant. So by not having to write grants, um, you, you you can be super creative, but at the same time you can get out of control, and that's the other aspect. I mean, that's the other thing that I have to worry about with uh, people in my lab is they have so much freedom that, yeah. and they you know once you are in a lab and doing experiments, it's hard. You don't want to stop doing experiments, but there's a point where you got to say, look, we got to we got to cap this thing. You know, it's time to put this moving you know thing that we're looking at into some kind of order that we can present it to the outside world um yeah. i can imagine it can be quite difficult to lose focus <clears throat> uh, it's you know to, to skip too early yeah so to it's too so on the one hand you know the sort of traditional um granting system forces you to be very narrow in the way that you're doing your work um not having that um off, you know, brings its own challenges, which is, it's very hard to focus. I mean, you've got to really, um, you know, have your own uh, sort of conceptualization of what's, what's important, what's not important um, uh, for sort of moving science forward. So I, I, my, my memories of uh... Geneva Research Campus was very much the lab environment and the collegiality was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, the beer at the bar was also, there was a particular stout that was mind-blowingly good. Uh, rather strong though, so you wouldn't want too much of it. <laughs> but also Selden Island. And I, I, I used to get out, I used to run around Selden Island each morning. So I, I, I know yourself, do you run around Selden Island? I know you enjoy some running. Yeah, I Selden Island is really an incredible place. It's a it's a floodplain that Janelia owns because, um, I mean, it, when they bought the property, um, basically it's a huge six mile circumference island that could not be developed. So they just bought it. And it's a personal sort of dream world for people to just walk or jog or bike around. Um, and uh, it's like heaven. I mean, I just totally love it out there. There's, you know, wild animals, you know, deer running all over the place. Um, 
And um, I think everybody at Chenelia has a, um, some experience or another with that, with that island. <laughs> so, so, so if I'm correct, tell, tell us about this picture. So this is a picture of a, a, a kayak with this beautiful tranquil water with trees either side. Tell me a bit right. about this. Okay, so to the right of that, the trees to the right is Selden Island. And that's my kayak. And it turns out, so Selden Island um, borders the Potomac River, which separates two states, Virginia and Maryland in the United States. And that's the Mason-Dixon line. I mean, basically that's the, di the difference between Maryland and Virginia is the difference between North and South USA. Um, so it's, a, it's an important river, actually. Um, the armies during the Civil War were going back and forth across that river. Um, but I live in Maryland, um, and Janelia is in Virginia. So I have two choices for getting to work. I can either drive across the river downstream about 10 miles or so, um, which involves heavy traffic and can be a total nightmare in terms of um, gridlock traffic, or I can kayak. And um, that's what I'm doing right there. <laughs> there. <laughs> so when it's nice outside and um, you know, I feel up to it, um, I will take my kayak and just paddle to work. And it's really spectacular. I love it. So how yeah. often do you get to do that in a week? Uh, well, I'll do it maybe two or uh, most uh, around two, two times a week during the summer uh, yep. when it, it's nice. Um, I've had some experience, you know, you can't do it during the winter or the late fall because otherwise you're going to be going home at a very early hour because you yep. do not, you don't go to Sutton Island when it's dark because um, it's scary. Um, I've been there and gotten sort of in a situation where I crossed the river and I realized I didn't have my car keys or my cell phone or anything. <laughs> and it was dark, it was pitch dark. And there was nothing on either side, on, on the Maryland side, it's complete wilderness. So I realized I had to get, I had to go back to Genelia and basically stay over the night at Genelia, but it was dark. So I had to be, you know, I was kayaking the pitch dark and then I had to get on that island and it's a four mile, um, bike ride to get, you know, back to Janelia. So it was not, it was scary, you know, because th there's just all kinds of weird animals. And um, I mean, it sounds like yeah. I may be a wimp, but <laughs> don't tell me that. Cause I was, was like, like really? well, <laughs> I was running around with my head torch. So I was there in January, February. So I had the head okay. torch early, early morning before dawn started. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, that's what I should have had as a head torch. And I didn't. So that was my mistake. Um, <laughs> That's cool. So you, you know, Janelia, uh, Janelia Research Campus, where did you, why did you even start biology? What was your inspiration? I, I presume your first degree was biology? Yep. Uh, well, actually, no, actually. So um, my first degree as an undergraduate was philosophy and psychology. Um, that was at a, a, a liberal arts college called Swarthmore College, a Quaker school in Pennsylvania. And um, I had gone in thinking that I was going to be a biology major because, and I took a lot of biology courses, but yep. um, it, this school is really well known for its philosophy and sort of, um, sort of broader perspective of human nature, humans. So I got really drawn into psychology and um, philosophy during that period and um, graduated in those fields. At that point, I really had no clue what I wanted to do when I finished graduation. And so um, that's where things really got fun in life, um, exciting. Uh, my future husband and I, who he was a, a Swarthmore student as well, we decided to go out to Africa, to Kenya, and teach high school. And um, so we got, because basically, we had never seen the world, you know, it's like, we've been, uh, you know, at students our whole life, you know, we need to understand the world to get a better perspective of what we're going to do for the rest of our lives. So we both 
um, this was in 1974, 75. We went out to, Af to Kenya, um, the Western province and um, taught high school. And this is where I got really transformed into science and biology because I realized first off psychology, the kind of psychology that I was doing just seemed completely irrelevant to this environment and to these people. And um, also um, actually sort of a funny story, but um, I had been in touch with a professor at Cornell when, before, as I went over who was doing um, the psychology underlying mathematical thinking in children. And he wanted me to do a survey there for um, uh, mathematical thinking. And yeah. so at some, you know, after a couple months when we had gotten there, I went out in the field with some students to try to, you know, get some of the data that he wanted. And, and I quickly realized this is nuts um, that these the fact that he's sitting in his ivory tower um, at his university and has no clue what these kids are experiencing and what these kids know versus don't know in their particular environment really turned me off to the kind of study that was associated um, you know, with this field at that time. So um, that, you know, I quickly sort of cut ties with that and realized, um, really dove into, you know, being a teacher at this high school. And they had no teachers in any of the science classes. So I taught physics, I taught chemistry, um, and I taught health science. Um, and uh, it was, and it was a high school, um, it's called a Harambe school. It was student kids who, girl, actually all girls who were living um, out in the bush. We were out in a, um, I mean, we were surrounded by mud huts everywhere and our, and our school had dirt floors, no electricity. Um, you know, I basically had to write the lesson plan on a blackboard and um, it was really transformative. Um, it made me realize, uh, you know, we, in order to really help this, you know, this community, these people, we needed, because there, you know, I could see all kinds of issues with, the way that they're, um, you know, the way they're growing their crops, the, um, the health conditions, the, you know, lack of knowledge of really basic fundamental um, things that could help their community um, uh, live in a more comfortable way. So uh, it also transformed my husband because um, he decided to go to become an international um, go into international uh, law. Um, and so when we came back, we knew exactly what we wanted to do. And, um, and on our way back, we did some really wild things like going to the Swat Valley, Pakistan, and yep. the Soviet Union, and um, Afghanistan, you know, different parts of Afghanistan. It was really fun. <laughs> this is, you know, way, way early. I mean, yeah. like, now, you know, the Swat Valley, you know, it, it's like a place that you would go and get, sh well, I mean, actually back then it was pretty bad too. It was scary, actually. Um, it was, some of these places were very scary. Um, we also went into Uganda when Idi Amin was there and, um, yeah. you know, searched for gorillas. And uh, it was a very exciting time that sort of, in some ways, it it got me so when I ended up back in the United States going to graduate school I was ready I mean it wasn't like oh I want to experience the world I knew what the world was and I knew what I wanted to do within it so that that made a huge difference and that was uh, a year uh, a year you know a year of teaching there yeah and so that's when you went into a degree in biology I presume and then yeah. So then actually it took me another two years <laughs> before I actually got a degree in biology. Cause so my husband immediately went to law school at Stanford and um, in order for us to survive financially, I decided to um, become a teacher. I was a high school teacher for another two years at a private school. 
And again, I was teaching physics, chemistry, earth science, algebra. Um, and, you know, it sort of drew, drew me into um, the world of biology and physical sciences. Uh, and that, that was a really great experience too, because this was a totally different environment. It was all boys, a private school, the kids were rich as all get out. And I could compare, you know, being in a school with all girls, you know, who dug, you know, who were, you know, farmers and, you know, living off the land yeah. versus these, you know, Palo Alto, you know, elite group of boys. It was just incredible. Um, so <laughs> it was fun. I mean, it was very interesting um, to say the least. So you were supporting your husband over that time. So you, you chose your career to support your husband, actually, which is very similar to my wife. Actually, so we, we both could have done PhDs, both had the options, and she went yeah. into teaching, actually, and supported me through my PhDs uh, days. And it's nice to see, you know, I think partners do do things as a team. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's very interesting because nowadays, a lot of couples just feel like, okay, no problem. I'll live in San Francisco and you'll live in New York City. Um, that, for, for at least my relationship with my husband, that's not something that we would want to do. I mean, we had spent so much, you know, we had gone through so much together, you know, as a team, you know, teaching in Africa, traveling around the world, that there was no way that we were not going to stay in the same place. <laughs> so after he finished law school at Stanford, um, we moved to the East Coast, um, where I started work in a PhD at Johns Hopkins, and he started at the State Department, um, his career there um, in international law. So that's anyway, it, yeah. So that, that, that's quite a, a change. And you can see how that's morphed in, into your degree, and then I guess into your PhD, uh, and to early uh, post-docking days. Yeah. How easy did you find the transition? You know, did you find any major challenges at the time of getting there and doing your PhD? Or was that, that experience, the motivation, uh, made it a lot easier to go through? So before I started my PhD, I did a master's. So what I did was my, the last year that my husband was a student at Stanford, I became a master's student at Stanford and started taking courses and, um, and worked actually in a lab there. Um, Phil Hanawalt, who did DNA repair work. This was the period of Stanford's unbelievable impact in molecular biology. This was the molecular biology revolution period, 78 to 80. And, um, you know, Paul Berg, Arthur Kornberg, these greats were, you know, around that campus. And I, I had classes with them. And I realized that I was in an environment with total scientific giants. It was just totally clear. And uh, I mean, they, they were so um, excited, you know, you, the first time that, you know, you've replicated DNA in a test tube you know, the first time that you've purified, you know, enzymes involved in DNA replication. And you could see this palpable excitement on that campus that you just could not, it couldn't rub off on, on you. So I felt that I had, and that was really formative experience for me because I took that and in other environments, you could sort of compare, you know, like I know what true giants are. I know, you know, so, you know, if you're in another environment that you may feel sort of intimidated by the people, you just say, well, how do they compare to Arthur Kornberg or Paul Berg, you know, and you realize, you know, they're not, yeah, <laughs> you know, they're, they may be at some level that, uh, but you're not going to necessarily be intimidated by them. Um, because you've, you know, you've, you've got that um, grounding in a really, uh, an you know what really great education is, you know what really great science is by being around those people. And that is really important. 
um, for anybody's career is to be in an environment where you see people who are truly outstanding so that you can um, in some way hope to be them, see them as a, a model uh, for your own uh, career. Okay. Now at that point, I was not thinking that I would have any, there was no way that I was in any way trying to compare myself to those people. Um, it just like, but it's so much fun to have, you know, it's like you're, it's so much fun to have idols. And so, you know, they were idols. It was cool. That, so, that's it. so that was the molecular biology explosion, 70s, yes. 80s. Well, that I, was I, cool. I think you're looking at the late 90s, noughties, and yeah. even through now, I think microscopy has really driven a lot of fundamental research in many areas of biology. So that's what's so cool. Okay, so, um, so when I left Stanford, that was the molecular biology sort of revolution, and came to Hopkins, I landed in a lab, uh, Doug Fambro, where he was um, working with monoclonal antibodies, which was another kind of revolution. Um, you know, the Nobel Prize for monoclonal antibodies was seen as a critical way that you could begin to identify proteins within cells um, with specific labels because you could tag a monoclonal antibody with a fluorescent probe. And so that was my entree into microscopy. Um, we attached fluorescent probes to monoclonal antibodies that targeted different subcellular structures. And the, my PhD project was, um, basically I had a monoclonal antibody library that I was screening and my PhD advisor said, just pick whatever monoclonal antibody you want and purify, you know, characterize the protein. And so I chose, first off, I screen, by screening it, I saw all these different distributions um, of proteins within cells. And nobody could tell me who, what they were. I mean, it was like, what's that? You know, like, so what's that? What's that? And I realized, oh my God, you know, this is like incredible. You know, we don't understand how these proteins, what these organelles are. So I chose um, the monoclonal antibody that I focused in on recognized the major lysosomal membrane protein, LAMP. And um, that's what I characterized. So I, I spent a lot of time studying lysosomes. Well, first off, we had to show that this was a lysosome. Um, and you know, the only definition of a lysosome at that point was from electron microscopy and things that are taken up from the outside, get concentrated there. But to be able to come in with a monoclonal antibody and identify those organelles was just really exciting. But what I think the key for me with microscopy is, first off, you had to use microscopes to look at all of this. But secondly, I realized very quickly that this, the protein that I was looking at on that lysosome did not stay on the lysosome all the time. If I treated cells differently, if I lowered pH, like with chloroquine, um, it moved to the plasma membrane. So it made me start thinking that these proteins are actually um, migrating, you know, and that there are intracellular pathways that are really defining the way that these proteins distribute within cells. And so that was the, the transition to my postdoc, where, um, you know, I was fully engaged in trying to understand organelle biology and intracellular trafficking mm. pathways. But again, we were limited to inverted microscopes. Uh, and it's just, it's really amazing when I tell my postdocs and students, they just can't believe uh, what life was like, you know, in the eighties, you know, uh, in terms of biology, cell biology. But, but they're going to yeah. be thinking, God, you were so lucky because all these unknowns, now we know them. So how do I, how do I form, forge a career now when so much is known? But the technology has moved forward so much. We can now still, it's still rich. I think there's still so much to be mined and discovered with the new technologies. It is and unbelievable. Right? And I think it's very important if you, um, what I realized, and basically I think this came out of being trained in philosophy, including you know, the history of science and the philosophy of science. 
you need to understand the way science progresses. And, you know, as you said, you know, it's progress, it progresses with technology. As new technologies come into the forefront, new questions open, new areas open up. And um, once you appreciate that, it really can help drive the way that you, you know, the kind of science that you choose. Um, and, uh, you know, basically with, I mean, I had already known with monoclonal antibodies that proteins are moving all over the place. And, but we didn't have microscopes to allow you to see this. And it was only with GFP that, um, and initially I wasn't, nobody was thinking GFP could, you would want to use it to look at anything moving around. But when my first graduate student got a hold of the clone from Marty Chalfie, and we put it onto a Golgi enzyme. And I'll never forget looking under our inverted microscope at the Golgi with the fluorescent um, GFP tagged to its enzyme. And I saw things moving from, it, the, it wasn't just localized at that Golgi. There were things sort of peeling off of that structure that I realized, we need a better scope. If we're gonna, you know, this, we can look at the, you know, we can't, you can't just take snapshots of this thing on your Polaroid camera, you need a different microscope. And it was at that time that I just said, okay, I'm at NIH, there is one confocal microscope on this campus, a BioRad. And yeah, of course. I, know, I went over and um, worked with Mark Terasaki who had that microscope. And we started taking movies, um, time-lapse movies of the GFP that was introduced either into the ER or the Golgi. And then that's when we very quickly realized, <laughs> um, and this was just complete um, uh, serendipity, but when we were you know, watching, you know, taking movies and stuff, we suddenly yeah. started thinking um, GFP was touted as a fluorophore that didn't bleach. You know, that's why it was so, so much better than fluorescent dyes. It did not bleach. And we just, you know, I said, okay, well, I don't think anything does not bleach, you know? Yeah. And so we decided, let's see if we can try to bleach this molecule in a living cell. And so to do that, we um, essentially zoom, we essentially put full power zoomed up at a, a sm small spot on this scope, um, small spot of the Golgi, and wiped out the fluorescence there. And you know, I was happy. Okay, cool. GFP does fluoresce. It does photo bleach. But what was mind boggling? <laughs> is the next, because we had it on a time-lapse imaging mode, the next few sequences, it started recovering. Yeah. And at the thing that was so incredible was that I realized nobody, including ourselves, were thinking about molecules diffusing in the cell, in membranes of a cell. And that, that was transformative to me. I mean, that was like, whoa, you know, this is not what I'm, you know, thinking about. And I realized instantly, this is significant. This is a technology that can open total windows into how proteins are anchored in different places in the cell. And so for the next three or four years, basically, we pushed that sort of con conceptual um, uh, approach. And it was not met, I mean, People couldn't question it, which was awesome. I mean, so that's really cool, is when you have something yeah. that you cannot question. Um, but there was some real, you know, people were not happy in some respects because, for instance, in the case of the Golgi apparatus, everybody assumed that the way molecules were retained within that organelle was by being anchored, immobilized in some fashion. And we showed that they were moving like maps. So that meant there had to be some other mechanism that was retaining these proteins in the Golgi apparatus. Um, and to this day, it's still 
debated how molecules are retained within that organelle. Um, so you, you've been at the forefront of quite a lot of new technologies as they came through. And obviously with uh, the photoactivatable fluorescent yeah. proteins, uh, which, which was mega, which actually ended up with Eric getting his Nobel Prize for yeah. that. And yeah. I, I think it was your seminal paper that, that was underpinning that. Where do you see the technology going in the future? Where's the unmet needs? Yeah. Um, it's going in a lot of different ones. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting. So sometimes you can't anticipate where that technology is going unless you're doing the technology. Um, and then you start seeing things that you hadn't appreciated before. Like, you know, with that foot, with the photo bleaching, I wasn't, you know, it's like, that's not something that we pre fabricate, you know, thought ahead of time that that was where we're going to go. And the mm -hmm. same with the photo activatable GFP. Um, the reason why we, and this was George Patterson in my lab um, who really said, I want to make a photo activatable GFP. Um, he wanted to make a better, way to do photo bleaching by photo activation. And um, that, you know, it worked beautifully. Uh, and then suddenly you realize that you can do a lot of things with that. And uh, single molecule photo conversion um, to, tr you know, to track individual molecules and to, to perform um, technology, you know, techniques like Palm and Storm, that was not something that we were thinking about at all. But Eric Betzig saw immediately with the publication of our photoactivatable GFP paper what it could be used for from that perspective. So the way that these new technologies are sort of um, developed is really interesting uh, from a sort of sociological uh, point of view. It's frequently not um, you know, individuals take it one step and then it's other individuals that come in and see, you know, see different directions where it can go. And basically that's, that's how I, I've been part of this whole system is I'm in a place where, you know, I've been, posi I position myself somehow into situations where you start seeing connections between uh, different technologies. Like right now, we're really excited about um, uh, using fo focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy um, developed uh, using the approach that Harold Hess at Genelia has been promoting, where you're using focused ion beam as a milling mechanism. Yes. When you, and you combine it with um, scanning EM, to be able to see at very high uh, isotropic resolution, everything within a cell. And combining that with technologies that allow us to look at how individual proteins are distributed um, is pretty exciting. And um, at cryo temperatures so that you have, you know, optimal uh, staining and optimal visualization of these probes. So looking at new probes uh, for pushing that is um, very helpful. Uh, you know, we've recently been able to see that we can use fluorescent dyes in a very productive way um, at these cryo temperatures to do correlative work um, in these electron microscopy regimes. Um, but you know, it's sort of like I'm going back and forth in terms of spatial temporal resolution. Uh, yeah. That sort of goes way down, but then you know there's a lot that you can get by coming back out um, with the dynamics. The dynamics are are also um, mind blowing. You know, there's um, almost like a yin yang between improved spatial resolution versus improved temporal resolution, yeah, and they and both I, I think give that's yes. still ex expanding to maybe the right way, but they're both developing at such a pace at the moment and, and also single cell technologies to start correlating these with I, I know, metabolites or yes. going through and 
yes. looking at the yeah. transfer zone, uh, you know, doing the high plex imaging, there's huge areas. Piecing all this, it's a massive jigsaw that we're creating. And the data yeah. analysis is, I think, going to be a real challenge. I, just, your, just, your, just your serial, just your FIBSEM and, and rendering the volumes is a massive challenge. Doing the actual data analysis and making sense of it statistically it is, it, it is going to be really difficult to do. I wanted to pull out all this work that you do. How do you balance that? Uh, we just, you can't, you're not all work, work, work. So obviously we've heard about Sound and Island, but yeah. what else do you do to spare time? Is it what do you enjoy doing just to get out of work? Yeah, yeah. Well, right now I'm out of work, which is actually pretty fun <laughs> in the sense of being home and not having to, you know, commute to work. Um, but yeah, totally. It's a, um, a challenge to, uh, you know, keep things moving in this kind of environment. Um, when your postdocs are locked at, you know, in their own environments. And um, I mean, fortunately, when this coronavirus hit us, um, there were many, the people in my lab were very well suited for putting papers together and stuff. So we've been working hard at that level. Um, it, it, this isn't working hard. <laughs> no, exactly. So that was in March. There's a picture of, my, where are you in this picture, Jennifer? Where are you? So I'm actually on the Potomac, on the, um, the uh, there's a trail along the Potomac on the Maryland side. And um, it's called the Marston Track. And I like going there at least once a week. Um, this is when the bluebells were out. Uh, oh. It's just magical. It, it, it was just absolutely beautiful. And um, yeah, that was in March. It, it, Gosh, your bluebells are much earlier than ours. <laughs> The blue bells of April. Are, when are yours? April? Okay. Uh, yeah, usually April uh, to, through to mid-May. And um, unfortunately, I, I got injured running. Uh, but we usually go through some gorgeous bluebell woods. And, and wow. by the time I could get out, and because of lockdown as well, I couldn't drive there. Uh, so by the time I got there, they were all fading. Oh, so I missed it this year. I'm gutted. That's too bad. That's too bad. This year, because normally I get so mad because it's the, it's the end of March and the beginning of April when these things come out and that's a horrible travel time for me. I mean, uh, like very bad travel where I'm gone every weekend almost, you know, with some sort of trip one way or another. Yeah. And, you know, I would, in the previous few years, you know, I'd only be out there once to be able to see them, you know, and it would be either too early, too late. Mm -hmm. Whereas during this lockdown, I go every other day. I mean, it's just, you feel like you're in a fairyland and it's stimulating. It really um, st stimulates your mind. Uh, so beyond, yeah. beyond running, which I know you're a fellow runner as yeah. well. Uh, so I, I believe you're also into plants and yes. more of that side now as a hobby? Yes. So, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, well, I love, I love plants because, you know, they're visually stimulating um but also it puts it makes makes me it takes you away from your own self it takes you away from the narrow perspective of humans um and the world um you know this earth is a big place that has a lot to it than just homo sapiens and i like thinking a lot about that and you know, I like thinking about the origin of life. I like thinking about um, how cells came about, the origin of eukaryotic cells um, and plants and the way that all of these systems are coordinating with each other um, in, a, you know, in, a, in a feedback system is, is just so mind boggling and yet fundamental to our you know, ability to um, be successful on this planet. And um, yeah, so that's, that's really, that has sort of plants I'm becoming much more impressed with because they are, and we eat them and 
Mm. Lots of other animals eat them. Without that, we don't have a way to get any kind of um, metabolites. Uh, so uh, am I correct in remembering that it's actually herbs that you, you've got a fondness of when it comes to different plants? Yeah, well, recently, yes. Um, yeah. And, and actually, <laughs> yeah, the herbs become interesting because you realize, um, you know, the, the coronavirus is obviously on everybody's mind and we have no treatment for this thing, zero. And, you know, it's it partly is, you know, the, the virus itself has a complex life cycle, but it's impacting, it's creating a whole feedback system in the body that, you know, is impacts all kinds of things, your immune system, you know, the way your kidney and liver, et cetera, are functioning. And, uh, you know, modern doctors, you know, they're treating each one of these things separately in these, in these patients who come into them. Um, and we know that, I mean, this is only the knowledge for that has only been acquired over the last 60, 70 years. Whereas humans have been dealing with viruses for thousands of years. And the way they deal with these viruses, as do animals, is by eating particular types of plants, herbs, and other things. And so it's made me super interested in trying to understand well, what is it about these herbs that are um, giving these sort of health benefits. And um, not that I, you know, can, I mean, I am zero, you know, sophisticated in this, but it's something. So if you seem very sophisticated, if I, if I ask you what herb this is. <laughs> I want to smell it. Yeah, go, 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 go for a sniff. Yeah, yeah. Um, basil. <laughs> I tease. That's a good spot. I, 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 do you know, I can't remember exactly what, so it's not the broad leaf basil. It's, it's very fine leaf, uh, yeah. sort of, I, I think a Greek type basil. Very, very pungent. Wow. Very pungent. What do you put it in? What do you put it in? Tea or? Uh, yeah, generally tomato based sauces, things yes. like that. So yeah, yeah. With pasta sauces, uh, yeah. good tomato, tin tomato, yeah, chopped tomatoes and plenty of the basil in it. I, I put, it might be a bit too strong for pesto. Yeah. Uh, but, but certainly for the sauces, it, it's great. Yeah. Really nice. So, you know, the other thing that's so interesting about these herbs and plants and stuff like that. Really quite nice. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and they're they're super good for you. I mean, you know, um, is you know we know so little about the physiology of our whole systems. I mean, one of the things that I've become ex interested in, um, you know, I've been a a cell biologist that has really used um, just tissue culture type cells to analyze how things are operating within these cells and seeing now that we have technologies that will allow us to actually see the way cells are interlocking with each other at very high resolution in tissues um it now makes you start thinking that we are poised for beginning to understand the way cells are working in the context of specific tissues yeah, and every environment yeah and you know feedback between that you know like the way that the nerve the how different tissues communicate with each other. Your nervous system communicates with your gut and your stomach. And that's all interlinked. Uh, and these herbs and these plants trigger those systems. Um, anyway. Yeah, no, I, I, well, I don't I, want to talk to me about all this. But anyway, I like thinking about it. It's fun. That's what I do when I'm sort of trapped at home. So where do you do... Where do you make? Where do you do most of your thinking? Is it whilst you're out walking, or is it at home? Is it in the bath? Is it where, oh, where do you do? Not <laughs> in the bar. Um, <laughs> not now. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's usually when I'm either out walking or um, you know I do a lot of. I mean, if I'm writing, I, I'll think. Um, if I'm writing a paper. And I'm, I mean, it's really fun to write papers and really get into the literature and you start trying to connect things. Um, you start thinking hard about that. And then reading, reading books, um, 
No, I was going to ask actually, do, do you, what, what's your preference, TV or books? Uh, it can vary. I mean, usually books. TV, sometimes I'll splurge. I mean, I'll do TV if I'm totally wiped out. Yeah. Uh, and, you know. So drama, uh, factual, do you binge watch a box set? What, what do you watch on uh, TV? Okay, let me think. Well, I just actually, um, I watched, I was in a exhausted mode a few weeks ago when I started watching Outlander. Yeah. But I stopped watching that. It's just way too violent um, after a while. And I then started realizing each episode was just, you know, increment. It wasn't as yeah. co complex and rich in the way that I wanted it. Um, but I recently picked up an, um, a book written by Herman Walk in the 70s called Winds of War. I don't know if you've ever, it was a huge no, no, bestseller no. there. Yeah. Then and it's about the the world World War Two essentially entry into World War Two, and World War Two itself and all of these, um, uh, you know from it's a it's a, a fictional novel but from the perspective of um, a family that was involved you know a family that is you know has a the head of the family is a military officer, but he ends up you know he interacts with. Hitler, Lenin, uh, Hitler, Stalin, um, Churchill, Roosevelt, and you are reading the interactions of him with these people, and you see the perspective of all of these different players at the onset of World War II, um, with all of the you know horrible you know challenges during that period, and um, it. It's just, it was just very cathartic because in many respects, we're in a, in a very difficult period right now um, in terms of what's happening um, across the globe. And in the same way that people during that period, individuals during that period had very limited potential to do anything. Things just were unflowing, you know, things were unfolding People did not know, you know, that Hitler was going to invade Russia. You know, they didn't, you know, they didn't know Hitler was going to invade Poland. Um, you didn't know ahead of time what was going to happen. And so in the same way that we do not know right now what's going to happen with this coronavirus, you know, we're about to face a total economic depression across the world, especially in the United States. Um, I, so, I don't think it's just a state. I, I think that's that's global. <laughs> yeah. And what does that mean? You know, we don't, we mm. don't, it's hard to think in the future and, um, you know, what's going to, how the future will unfold itself. And so reading this book brought that into very tight focus. And it was super exciting because you were educated about the whole the whole world, the, the world during that period. So, so anyway, so I love, uh, that's so much fun to read something like that. So much fun, but that was really cheery. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, for some reason it, um, I, the, I'm depressed. It, it wasn't, <laughs> it yeah, no, it, it's not so depressing because it makes you, well, you realize it's an important time yeah. that, you know, it's an important time that we need to take seriously. Yeah. That we have to have people who are in charge, who are people who, I mean, you realize how important it is to have leaders that um, are smart and listen to, ex, you know, experts and, you know, can, can make good decisions. Um, but at the same time, things unfold that you can't predict. Um, um, and no, yeah, no, it's say there's a huge unknown. Uh, to, to cheer things up, I've, I've got one more picture that I think you sent, and I have no idea what this picture is about. But oh I, my I, god! I can see a monkey. Yes, that's a yeah. chimpanzee. Yeah, that's a, a chimpanzee. baby chimpanzee. Yeah, and that's uh, me with my daughter, Leanna. So Leanna um, uh, went to Cameroon as a Peace Corps volunteer, and. Um, this was during a trip where my husband and I, uh, as well as my other daughter, um, went to visit her. 
and she took us to this island where um, they have created a sanctuary for uh, baby chimps that have you know, been abandoned or you know, their parents have died or whatever. And these chimps are grown up to about age five and then they're taken to another island where there's a whole bunch of wild chimps, adult chimps. Adult chimps, we also went to that island, you do not get off. <laughs> adult chimps are scary. They are very smart and scary. Yeah, this so is these aren't on Selden Island. That, that's not why you no, don't go down the dark. No, right? no. It, these guys were the cutest things. And um, the, it, it's truly amazing how smart they are. They're just like little kids. Um, they, uh, you know, I had a sneaker on and I, I tied my sneaker and they, there were three of them that just immediately ran, immediately knelt down and just watched what I was doing as I was tying my shoe. And um, at one point, I can't remember, um, I took off the shoe to show it to one of the chimps. Uh, Cause you know, they were, you know, they were humanized. So they were not afraid of humans. Yep. And that chimp took the, the um, grab, you know, as soon as he had the uh, sneaker, he ran up into a tree with it. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh my God, I'll never get this, this sneaker back. Then when we watched him up in the tree, he was trying to tie the shoe. It was, it was unbelievable. It was like a little kid who was trying to you know, do exactly what I was doing, what I had done. He was trying to, you know, and then ultimately we were able to distract him and he came down and I got my shoe back. But it, it it's, uh, if you, have you ever been on a safari in Africa? Uh, yes, uh, down in Zimbabwe, but, but not that up close. It was, it was quite a wild safari. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's truly, I think we don't understand, we don't appreciate the, the knowledge that animals have, their intelligence. Um, it's, it's profound. Um, anyway, so that was fun. Yeah. That was like, wow, fun. I, I've got. To, I think we've just got a few minutes left. Okay. Is there any key points? I notice you've done a lot. Uh, you were president of ASCB, uh, so big societies. Getting involved in other activities outside of the, the main workplace, uh, such as ASCB, yeah. how important do you think those sorts of activities are? I think they're really important. Um, I think it's really important to know your scientific community. You cannot do science in a vacuum. Um, you need to understand that your the knowledge is part of a broader understanding of people, and those people all have to share lang a common language, a common thinking about a system. I mean, where are you frequent, you know, and you know, when and especially if you have, there are a lot of times when people have very different perspectives for how something works and it's only when pe when people come together that they can actually share those different ideas and um you know you can come to a, an agreement and move forward in terms of the understanding i mean i remember when i was a, a graduate student being so excited when i went to these meetings especially small meetings where you can hear people talk to each other big the the big shots sort of the kinds of questions that they were asking and that was so important for me because it allowed me to understand what the questions were in the field what is it that people really did not understand it's very hard to get that information from just reading papers i mean you know people say oh it's not understand this that and the other thing but you don't really understand the depth of that knowledge or lack of knowledge in a particular area, unless you hear it from people who are actually talking about that science in, a, in an open, dynamic way. So I, I think that actually chimes with a lot of common thoughts, actually. I, it's been, lockdown has changed an awful lot of things, the way we behave, the way we're interacting with people, 
Uh, yes. And a lot yes. of uh, we've hosted lots of large yeah. forums with up to yeah. 300 people and and we're interacting really well but i don't think that that is sustainable because i think the younger generations coming through they need that face-to-face -face networking opportunity the totally. time eating uh, eating together drinking together having that social time to really get to understand people and, and to hear new ideas to think of new ideas they're inspirational totally life. totally um i mean the, it was only when my postdoc, George Patterson, I took him to a Gordon conference with me where he was presenting his work um, using photo bleaching that he realized that people were not willing to accept some of his conclusions because he was not, it wasn't as compelling as it could be. And he realized the only way he could convince them was to create a photoactivatable fluorescent protein. And it was that motivation. Um, it was, you know, it, it, seeing people and having people question what you're doing and realizing that if you're, if, if you think you're right, you got to take it to another level. And um, what is the level that they, that would be acceptable in the community in terms of technology, et cetera. So all of this is really important. These sorts of interactions are fundamental for the way that um, science has progressed in the past. And, um, you know, it would be very sad if we did not have that um, able to come back uh, and flourish uh, the way it has um, in the past. Because, yeah, Zoom calls are good. And definitely, you know, sometimes I'm going to be doing a virtual meeting in a month and you just realize how much time and energy, you know, money is saved by people just popping on to their computers from their home. But there's a lot that's missing. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> couldn't, couldn't agree more. I have two more quick questions for you. First okay. one, actually, is a really odd one. What is your favorite publication that you've done? It, it may not be one of your mega papers. It may be a smaller paper. Which one are you most proud of? as a publication? Well, there is a paper that um, we published in Journal Cell Biology many years back that I was very proud of um, in terms of the way we wrote it, but also in terms of the quanti quantification. Um, basically, we were quantifying secretory trafficking um, using fluorescent, we, uh, a fluorescent GFP, of different cargoes that were moving through the secretory pathway. And we were correlating the fluorescent intensity from our images to an actual number of molecules. And um, in addition to sort of doing that, we were, um, we quantified the different steps in that pathway from the framework of, of rate constants and um, what that immediately led us to realize was that the rate constants were not changing depend, uh, based on how much cargo we had, which meant that the way cargo was moving from one place to another was mass action, which was not what people had thought. Um, and that has huge implications for the way that the whole machinery that's regulating the secretory traffic pathway works. Um, so for me, that paper um, was really, I mean, it took a long time to get together, to, you know, to put it together. Um, and it involved interacting with some physicists because we needed to interpret, you know, what these rate constants meant, we, and also modelers. So we had, mo this paper was modeling of, of these different steps. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of things that were happening. There was modeling, there was physics involved, um, and then just basic cell biology. A very, and, very interdisciplinary. Yeah, and it was so much fun because of that. Um, you know, hours on phones, you know, with physicists at Rockefeller, you know, a modeler, you know, um, Bob Fair, uh, who, you know, works out of his own, you know, company, his own home sort of thing. And it, yeah, it, it was just, it was really fun. So that, I would say that's one of my that's one of your favorite favorites. publications. And one last question is, 
any advice you give anyone uh, in a PhD or early postdoc career? I would say just keep up the spirit, you know, um, don't give up. Um, you know, it, and don't worry. <laughs> That's, I think, a really important advice. Um, you know, frequently, you know, sometimes these with postdocs, we over worry them with, oh, you need to be trained to do this and that and the other thing. And that continually reminds them of their inadequacies and makes them have to compare themselves with people who are, you know, who've been PIs for 20 years or 10 years. And, you know, people grow. There's, you, you tend to compare yourself with somebody who's 10 or 20 years ahead of you and you don't realize that they've been at it for 20 years or 10 years. And so of course they know what they're doing. Um, everybody who starts out has a similar sort of degree of ignorance and, you know, is going to make mistakes and, you know, um, is going to, you know, be scared and have a hard time. What's important is to just love what you're doing, love the science, um, focus in on the questions that you're interested in and don't worry about, am I going to really get this job? Do I have to make this decision or that, you know, um, I mean, that's just, that's been my philosophy, but. And it's um, worked. Yeah. And it's worked. Yeah. No, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Let the opportunities come to you. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Follow those, follow the opportunities where they're right for you and follow your strengths. And yes, I like the yes. advice earlier as well about not being intimidated by giants in the field. Uh, yeah. As you've shown today, the giants are very personable, normal people who uh, like all sorts of things. <laughs> uh, so they are just, just normal people. And, to approach yes. those networking opportunities are great. Definitely. So yeah, don't, don't be scared is great advice. Jennifer, I, I think we're up to time now. Thank yeah. you so much for joining me today. It's been Thank really you, good. To this has really you. been fun. Very good. Uh, I will hopefully see you <laughs> properly. I know. I, I am looking forward to it. Yes. Uh, again yeah. in the future. Jennifer, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Microscopists a bite-sized bio podcast sponsored by Zeiss Microscopy. To view all audio and video recordings from this series, please visit bitesizebio.com forward slash the microscopists.